Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to church. I am Pastor Jack, and I welcome you back to Holy Trinity. What a beautiful day we have in our area today. The storm is over, so we're between storms, I understand. So let's enjoy the sunshine and the better temperatures, and welcome to church as we praise the Lord. Just two uh, quick announcements. First, we welcome back Jennifer Foos as our guest musician. Jennifer, thank you for coming today. And we have some prayer concerns to share. Uh, please remember Marga Khan in your prayers. She was recently hospitalized at Chilton Hospital. Ellen, is she still there or did she? She got home. Praise the Lord. I, I thought that would happen. So our prayers go to Marga. And Marga, if you're watching online, you know we love you and we're praying for you. We're also praying for Kurt Leifkin. Kurt had surgery this week on his ribs and we pray that the good lord will bless him with healing shannon do not make him laugh that might hurt if he starts laughing uh, and we also pray for megan hadem and uh, andrew duffy uh, they were married a couple years ago and they welcomed a brand new baby girl into their lives named annabelle marguerite now Later in the service, we're going to see a picture of this beautiful baby. We'll put her picture up during the announcements today, and you'll see what a beautiful baby girl. So congratulations to Megan and Andrew on their new baby girl. Let's start with the children, as we always do. Come on up. We have lots to talk about, as always. Lots to talk about. Good morning. What a beautiful day we have, as Mr. Rogers would say. What a beautiful day in the neighborhood. Glad you're here. And I want to ask you, do you remember the name of our church season? Not the season of the year, the church season. Starts with the letter L. Go for it. Lent. Absolutely. Very good. We are in the season of Lent, which is a 40-day period before Easter. What's the color of the church season? What color do you see? Um, purple. purple. Purple, my favorite color. So I, I like wearing purple. It's my favorite color. The season of Lent, it's not Lent, it's Lent. All right, there's a special day coming up on Friday. Does anybody know what, what's going to happen on Friday? Very special day. Anybody know? Well, I get a chance to tell you. It is St. Patrick's Day on Friday. St. Patrick's Day. You know what's interesting about St. Patrick's Day? We, have, we honor the saints of God all throughout the year. Did you know there is a St. Peter's Day and a St. Paul's Day and a St. John's Day and a St. Matthew? But nobody knows what days they are. But everybody seems to remember St. Patrick. It's March the 17th, St. Patrick's Day. And I have something to show you which is a, a symbol of St. Patrick's Day. Do you see this here? You know what this is? What this is a symbol of? A four-leaf clover. Close, very close. He, uh, Levi said it's a four-leaf clover. It looks like one, uh, but you'll notice there's only three leaves on this one. It's not a four-leaf clover, but it's a certain symbol that we associate with St. Patrick, and I'll tell you a little story about it. What do you think this is? It's a symbol of love. A <laughs> very good answer. It's, it's a symbol of love. And this is called a shamrock. A shamrock is a type of clover. And I'll tell you a little story. There was a man named Patrick well, a long, long time ago. Now, Patrick was born and raised in Italy. Patrick was an Italian man who traveled north. He became a Christian. He traveled north. And he started telling people all about Jesus in an area we now call Ireland. And uh, so Patrick went up there, he was talking about Jesus and God, and he, he took this shamrock, which is kind of like a clover, and he said, I'm going to teach you about God. There are three names for God, and there are three sections of the shamrock. The three names for God are God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So Patrick actually used this as a teaching tool. He picked the clover up and he said, do you see the three sections? One for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Spirit. And when we baptize people, we baptize them in the name of the Father, 
and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Those three things. That's called the Trinity. And guess what? Our church is called Holy Trinity Church, right? So that's where St. Patrick was talking about the Trinity. What's this called? What's it called? A shamrock, right? Now you might see these uh, where you go in your community. They're, they might be in school windows, store windows. And there's a special color we're supposed to wear on Friday, which is St. Patrick's Day, a special color. Do we wear purple? No. Do we wear blue? Do we wear pink? What do we wear? We wear green, yes. Because green reminds us of the shamrock, the teaching tool that St. Patrick used a long, long time time ago. So that's what, the, what it's all about on Friday. If you have something green that you can wear, uh, that would be great. If you have a, a shirt or pants or something that's green, put it on. It's a lot of fun to honor St. Patrick on Friday. Now, we call him St. Patrick because he's one of the great people that went around telling people about Jesus. You got it? March 17th, Friday, St. Patrick's Day. Don't forget what a great day it is to worship God and honor this wonderful, wonderful man. Can we say a prayer about that? Can we pray? Grown-ups, join us in prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord, our God, we thank You and praise You for all the great men and women who have proclaimed their faith and shared it with others. And this Friday, we especially will lift up St. Patrick. We thank You, Lord, for all the great work that Patrick did he went near and far telling everybody about You and teaching them about the Holy Trinity. Thank You, Lord, for great people like St. Patrick as we thank You and praise You in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am really, really happy that you came to church today. Mrs. Greiner has a great lesson. Ms. Wendy has a great lesson for you. So why don't you follow Ms. Mrs. Greiner and Ms. Wendy and have a wonderful day. Top of the morning is what St. Patrick says. Top of the morning to you. And we'll continue now with our prelude by Jennifer Foos. Thank you, Jennifer. One of our favorite Twilight Paris songs, We Shall Behold Him. If you're able to stand, please rise as we continue with our confession and forgiveness. 
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and God's mercy. Let's take a moment now for silent reflection and prayer. Holy God, we confess to You our faults and failings. Too often we neglect and do not trust Your Holy Word. We take for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward Your creation. We cause hurt though You call us to heal. We choose fear over compassion. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us as we seek to follow in Your way of life Amen. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son so that all who may receive eternal life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy and forgives you in Christ's name and revives you in the Spirit's power. Amen. Please remain standing for our first hymn today. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, the fountain of living water, you quench our thirst and wash away our sin. Give us this water always. Bring us to drink from the well that flows from the beauty of your truth through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated now as we continue with our assigned Scripture verses for today. Good morning. Our reading for this morning is from Romans 5. In the reading, St. Paul reminds Christians that suffering can make us spiritually stronger when we rely on the grace of God and we can acquire great wisdom from the lessons we learn from our trials and tribulations. St. Paul writes, Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to the grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit 
that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the nighttime Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were, <clears throat> were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we have been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely having been <clears throat> reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God. Here ends the reading. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel if you are able. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the fourth chapter. In this encounter with a Samaritan woman, Jesus offers a play on words to indicate that he offers living water. St. John writes, Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to Jesus, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. But Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well with his sons and the flocks that drank from it? And Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Please have a seat, everybody. Today I greet you in the name of the risen and victorious Lord, and what a beautiful day we have here at Lake Telemark. Those of you who were part of the Good Friday lunch this past Friday, uh, if you were there, this sermon is going to sound real familiar to you. I would like you to look up at the monitor this morning. You'll see two people presented on the monitor screen. On your left side there is Kelly Clarkson, a famous American singer and songwriter. And on your right is a 19th century German philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, they have a lot in common, these two, believe it or not. You know what they have in common? They each said these words, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that's what I'm going to preach about today. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I want you to think about that. Not far from here, there is a gym where people go to work out. And there should be a sign above everybody that says, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You walk into that gym and people are lifting weights they're grunting and they're groaning and they're pushing weights with their legs and with their hands and they're, they're just really straining. And then next to them, there are people on treadmills and they're running as fast as they can. They can hardly breathe. There's sweat falling off of their bodies. They should all look up at the height of the workout where it says, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. 
Here's one for you. How many of you have in, ever engaged in physical therapy? Ra raise your hand if you've ever had physical therapy. Look at that. Almost everybody. It's funny because I, I asked that question on Friday. Almost everybody raised their hand. Today at 9 o'clock in Sparta, all the hands went up. And today, almost every single hand went up. Physical therapy. Now, you know in the medical world, the, the, the letters that designate physical therapy are PT. They think it stands for physical therapy, PT, but we all know better. We know that PT stands for physical torture. That's what it stands for. Physical torture. I have a nephew who is a professional physical torturist. And I'm always saying, why do you put these people through the mill? You're killing these people. It's physical torture. And he says, Uncle Jack, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And we do know that physical therapy does make you stronger. What do we learn about all this? Well, we learn that we can apply these lessons to everyday life. When you're going through stress in your life, when there is tension, when there is pressure in your life, when you endure that pressure, it actually makes you a stronger person. Did you know that? It does. You come out of your experience stronger than you did when you went in. If you're in a crisis, if you're in a situation that is pressing on your nerves and your faith, you find out that there are reserves, spiritual reserves you can count on, people around you. You actually get stronger through and after the process. St. Paul basically said these words. St. Paul basically said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But he used these beautiful words from our first reading. Paul writes, suffering produces endurance. That's a good thing. Endurance produces character. That's a good thing. Character produces hope. That's a good thing. What is Paul trying to say? Paul says that when you go through tension, when you go through the trials and tribulations of life, you get to be a stronger person. You get spiritually stronger. You rely on God. You rely on your reserves. And you know that the Holy Spirit will strengthen you in and through the process. You actually get stronger with the resistance. Again, I go back to the whole weightlifting illustration. When you're lifting weights, you are putting resistance on your weights. Let's say you're working on your biceps. You're putting resistance on those muscles. And what happens after a, a certain time? The muscles get stronger because of the resistance. They get stronger. Now, the human body is very, very interesting. What happens if you sit in a chair and never get up? Let's say you don't walk around and days and weeks and months go by. What happens to your legs if you never walk? They become weak, they atrophy, and you won't be able to walk again. That's why they tell seniors today, the elderly, keep moving, keep on moving, get those legs exercised, get on your feet, because the more you sit, the worse it gets. This is what the whole concept is, is resistance builds strength, or as Paul says, endurance. And that's true in your problems in life. You lean into the problems. You rely on the grace of God. You rely on the strength of God to get you through those very difficult times. And don't get me wrong. You're not sitting there saying, gee, I wish I have some rough times in my life because I want to get stronger. Or why doesn't God send me a crisis? I need to build up my spiritual reserves. No, you don't welcome a crisis. You don't invite a crisis. You don't look forward to a crisis. But it's amazing what happens when you're in a crisis. You discover things about yourself you never knew. You discover you're stronger than you think you were. And you discover that by the grace of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit, the resistance gets you stronger by the grace of God. There was an experiment, a scientific experiment conducted years ago 
where they took bumblebees up to the International Space Station. They wanted to see how do bumblebees behave in zero gravity situations. What's going to happen? So they took a whole bunch of bumblebees up to the space station. The bees had plenty of oxygen. They had plenty of food and nutrition. But something strange happened. After three or four days, each one of those bumblebees simply dropped dead, died. They couldn't figure out what happened. So they brought another group of bumblebees later back up to the space station, plenty of food, plenty of oxygen, plenty of nutrition. After three or four days, the second group of bees also collapsed and died right there. They said, what's going on? And they made an interesting scientific discovery. The bumblebees need the resistance and gravity for their wings. When they're flapping their wings, resistance and gravity makes them stronger. It makes them stronger. And when they were up in space, the bees are like, hey, we don't have to flap our wings. We're just going to kind of glide around and float around. They weren't exercising. They weren't building up their wings. And finally, they withered and died. Another thing happened when they were studying butterflies. Now, as many of you know, a caterpillar goes in and makes a chrysalis, a cocoon, if you will. And then after about four weeks or so, the butterfly then begins pushing against the walls of the cocoon, fighting like crazy to get out. Eventually, the cocoon splits and the butterfly emerges from the cocoon and flies away. Well, the scientists thought, why should the butterfly have to struggle to get out of, the, out of the cocoon? We'll make it easier. We're going to cut a little hole in the side of the cocoon to open it up. So the butterfly, instead of struggling and frantically trying to get out, the butterfly can simply fly right out of the cocoon. Well, they discovered something very powerful. When they opened the cocoon for the butterflies, the, the butterflies could not fly. What happened? They discovered that the butterfly needed the physical activity of pushing against the sides of the cocoon, of struggling to get out. And it made the wings stronger by pushing and pushing and pushing to the point where by the time the cocoon opened, the butterfly was strong enough then to fly free. Resistance strengthened the wings of the butterfly. Wow. In many walks of life, resistance actually makes us stronger. There was a longitudinal study conducted by the University of Southern California. They followed children from age 5 to age 25. They followed the progression of children, and they had two different studies going on. On the one group of studies, they took wealthy children, and these kids were given anything they wanted, whenever they wanted. Today, we would call them spoiled brats, all right? <laughs> they took the spoiled brats and said, what do you want? Here, you have, you want the best toys, you want ice cream for dinner. I'm probably exaggerating, but they spoiled these kids. But the other group, they said to the kids, you're going to participate in everything we do. You're going to work for things. You're going to get rewards for working at things. You're going to put an effort into it. As some of us say, you're going to put skin in the game. Well, after 20 years or so, they studied the personalities of these groups. They looked at the kids who were rich and spoiled and had everything handed to them. Guess what? These kids were lazy. They didn't know how to handle adversity. They didn't work hard at their jobs. They just wanted to float around. They weren't even challenged. They weren't even developing themselves intellectually. But then they looked at the other group where the kids had to work and the kids had to put effort into it, a little sweat equity into their projects. And these kids were thriving. They, were, they got good jobs. They were successful in their careers. What does that tell you? It tells you that the trials, the resistance, the challenges of life, they're not welcome, they're not invited, but they make you stronger. You become a stronger person. Your personality is stronger. Your faith in God becomes stronger because you realize that life is just not a walk through the park. 
Life can be difficult at times. And you need those emotional reserves. You need the spiritual reserves to carry you through when adversity comes your way. These are lessons that St. Paul was trying to share when he wrote, suffering does produce endurance. Endurance does produce character. Character does produce hope. We learn some lessons in our challenges in life. The first thing is we learn that we are stronger than we think we are. I'll say that again. We're stronger than we think we are. Does anybody know of a man named David Goggins? David Goggins is pictured on your monitor screen. He's the guy on the left side there. David Goggins is now 48 years old. He is a retired Navy SEAL veteran, and he's tough as nails. You know what he does for fun? He runs in ultra marathons just for fun. Now, marathons are one thing. Marathons, as you will all know, are 26 miles long. You run for 26 miles. But David Goggins, well, he takes it much further than that. He goes in ultra marathons. In ultra marathons, you run anywhere from 75 miles to 100 miles without stopping. Can you imagine running 75 to 100 miles without stopping? And it gets even better. He's like, oh, I want to put pressure on this. So he does this in the middle of a desert. By the time he finishes his journey of 75 to 100 miles in the desert, his feet look like raw hamburger. But he says to people, and he's written inspirational books, and he says, when you think you can't go any further, when you think you're having a crisis and you can't take another step, when you think you can't face another day, there's always something in your tank. There's always a reserve in your soul that will give you the strength and the endurance to carry on. He says, never give up because there's something inside of you that will propel you to go forward. And we say, that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in you, motivating you, endure, allowing you to endure the trials and tribulations. Don't give up. David Goggin says, in life, there are times when you just want to sit down and cry and get it over with. But that's the time when you can reach down. When you think you're running on fumes, those fumes are going to get you to the finish line of your life. And another thing is, we appreciate the blessings we have. That's a lesson we learn during difficult times. The blessings we have. I want to tell you a story of something that happened in 1873. There was a man, a very dedicated Christian by the name of Horatio Gates Spafford. Well, one day, this is 1873, he sent his wife and four daughters across the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I, also, I often think about that, and I say, there was a day when I wanted to send my wife and children across the Atlantic Ocean, but that's a different story altogether. This is a much serious, more serious story. 1873, he sent his wife and four daughters across the Atlantic Ocean. They got part way across the ocean. There was a terrible disaster at sea. All four of his daughters perished at sea. All four of his daughters plunged to their watery grave. And only the wife survived. Not long after that, Horatio himself took the journey across the Atlantic Ocean. And he arrived at the spot where the disaster took place, right there in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. He dropped on his knees and he prayed to Almighty God. Now here is a man who is grieving, grieving so rawly and desperately for the loss of all four of his daughters. He falls on his knees. He says a prayer to God. And then he penned one of the most inspirational words you'll ever hear. It is well, it is well with my soul. Those very words 
have now become a very inspirational Christian hymn. It is well, it is well with my soul. How could a man face the ultimate tragedy of losing all of his children and still say, it is well with my soul because the Holy Spirit was still lifting him. The Holy Spirit was comforting him in his grief. The Holy Spirit was whispering in his soul, you will survive this tragedy. One of my favorite Bible verses, and I've shared this with you so many times, is Proverbs chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Because there will be times when all you got left is your faith. You've had tragedy in your life. You've had something going on. And all you have left is your spiritual reserve. And God says, what does God say? God says, I will be with you always. I will neither leave you nor forsake you. I will give you the spiritual strength you need to carry on. And somehow Horatio Gates, when he was peering over the edge of that ship and looking at the tragic place where his daughters died, he said to himself, my life is a mess, but my spirit is still strong because the Lord my God will lift me and strengthen me. You've heard the famous poem, Footprints in the Sand, where the guy says, during the rough times, there's only one set of footprints. That's because that's when God was carrying him, and that's what God does with you. I don't know what you're going through in your life right now, but if you're going through a crisis, if you're going through a challenge, if there's something that's overwhelming, you can't go another day. That's what you're thinking. But the Lord is saying, I will be there. I will lift you, and it is well with your soul. I will get you there to the finish line of life. What did Paul say? I remind you again of what Paul said. He said, suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. And character produces hope. Whatever you're going through today, don't give up. Don't give up. But lean on the everlasting arms of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And tell yourself over and over, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Thanks be to God. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. If you are able, please stand at this time as we proclaim the beautiful words of the Apostles' Creed.
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, He rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated at this time. And once again, our choir has a very, very special anthem they would like to share with you this morning. It's time for our weekly offering. And as we always say, 
God was generous by giving His only begotten Son, and we respond in generosity to His love. So please be as generous as you are able to support the ministries here, but ministries way beyond the walls of this congregation as well. Please rise as the offerings are brought forward. Let us pray, God of good gifts, receive these and all our offerings as we present them in faithful service for the sake of your gospel. Prepare our hearts to receive you in this meal as you pour out your very presence through Christ Jesus, the wellspring of eternal life. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now we join to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today, I remind you once more that Holy Communion is available for everyone. It doesn't matter what Christian background you come from. If you prefer gluten-free wafers, they are located on the container right in front of the organ over there. And when you approach the trays, the inner glasses are filled with grape juice and the two outer rows are filled with wine. Please follow the instructions of your ushers. You may be seated at this time. Once again, if you're able to stand, please rise. And let us pray. Embodied God, at your table we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. 
Amen. God, the giver of love, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you in this Lenten journey. Amen. Please have a seat, everyone. Again, thank you for coming to church today and making Jesus the priority for your day today. I introduce, as always, uh, Joan Cosgrove, who's our council president. And Joan, what do we always say? We always thank our musician, right? So thank you, Jennifer, for being with us today. Let's we'll give her a round of applause. There's a lot to talk about, so go for it. What day is better, but the 24th is KDM's talent show night. We're going to change the date, so just hang tight. Okay. Sorry about that. Wrong information again. Uh, however, when we do have it, the kids are going to have pizza, water, and popcorn, so that should be fun. So tell them to bring their friends. This is what we're looking for, a, a plethora of children, just happy. Uh, we do have two pictures up there. I'm sure the parent, pastor wants to say something about it, but before I do, uh, we are having a welcome meeting right after church. You're welcome to come. Uh, we have, it, it's going to be in the choir room, and you're all welcome. Now to talk about this picture, I don't know whether she's familiar or not, but we all know Megan. Megan had her little baby girl. Now, I think it's Annabella Marguerite. Wow, that's quite a handle for a little baby, isn't it? Okay, this is a picture of the baby and a picture of mommy and baby. Congratulations, Megan, if you're watching, and if not. Yeah. Megan is one of our, uh, our Sunday school teachers, so. Um, do we have any other announcements to make? Pastor. Okay. Yeah, just a special shout out to the man in the control room here, Jonathan Bollard. Jonathan, we really appreciate everything that you do. Yeah, give him a round of applause here. He's a, a very, very intelligent young man, and uh, he's been filling in very nicely while uh, Don Gullickson and Donna are enjoying warmer climates for a while. So thanks again, Jonathan. You do a fantastic job every Sunday. Thank you. He's very shy. Stop by and tell him thank you. Go in peace. Serve the love. We eat those three bells out today. Thank you, Artie. Okay.